Well, hello, everyone. Welcome back to our FSHD University Educational Webinar Series. Um, we've created FSHDU, as we'll call it, um, to keep the learning going and to give FSHD families an arsenal of knowledge so they, they can be their own best advocates. Um, we're focused really on three departments, if you will, physical health, mental health, and research, drawing on the many resourceful and creative people we have in our community, some of them with us today. Um, over time, we expect to establish new departments um, to address additional areas where we see a thirst for knowledge. Your input and suggestions are very much welcome because this is your university. Um, and of course, you can always visit our website to access all of these materials and see what events are coming up um, next. And I'll put, I'll put the, um, the link to that direct page um, in the chat here in a minute. But today, from both our physical health and our research departments, we are very fortunate to have Leanne Lewis, Katie Eichinger, and Jeff Statland, um, the key investigators on a survey study to assess how the neuromuscular patient community was responding to the social distancing policies that were imposed by the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, June, would you like to properly introduce our guests? Uh, I don't know how proper it can be, but <laughs> I will do my best. So. <laughs> So uh, Jeffrey Statland, I think many of you know, he is at the University of Kansas Medical School, and he is also the principal investigator of the FSHD Clinical Trial Research Network. Uh, he has done countless studies in FSHD, including the uh, Resolve study that um, a couple hundred of you out there are volunteers for right now. So um, he is, uh, you know, he's oversees a tremendous amount of research in our community. Uh, Katie Eichinger uh, is, she is a research physical therapist and um, key member of the research team at the University of Rochester. Uh, and she was involved in the study that we'll be discussing. And then Leanne Lewis, uh, who is also at the University of Rochester, uh, was very much involved, I think, she communicated with me, so I, I think I think consider her as the instigator of this study, uh, which was um, done in the early part of the COVID-19 shutdown. And I think many of us were really concerned about the impact of the social distancing policies and isolation that might result um, on our community. So. Uh, Leanne um, and her colleagues put together a survey and we helped to distribute it. And we're so grateful to the couple hundred of you who responded. So we have some good data from that. And um, so I would like to turn it over to uh, our speaker team. I, Leanne, will you be the one? Yes. I'm speaking? Okay, so you can go ahead and share your slides, use the share screen function. Yep. And I will. And I assume you can see it. Thank you. Yes, looks good, yes. Okay, great. Well, thank you. Um, thank you for attending this discussion um, and thank you to the FSHD Society for hosting this webinar. Um, we always think of the FSHD Society as an important partner in helping us researchers get our information out to the patients. Um, so, so thank you for helping us do that. Um, and again, I'm Leanne Lewis. I am um, the main FSHD research coordinator at the University of Rochester, working primarily with Dr. Rabi Tawil. And, um, and then of course, um, I work with um, Dr. Kate Eichinger. And then through the um, FSHD Clinical Trial Research Network, I'm the lead coordinator. And so I get to work with Dr. Statland and his team at Kansas University um, a lot. So, um, so that's, that's my background real quick. And I just do want to say um, thank you to Dr. Statland um, for coming up with this real this idea originally, and then um, mentoring me through the process, um, and then as well as Kate for being such a great partner in this whole project, um, and and allowing me to learn a lot from her as well. Um, so, let's start with this. Always takes a second to go. I don't want to hit it too many times and then have it not proceed. There it goes. Okay. 
Um, so as an introduction, um, we created the COVID-19 and social policy impact survey. This was created by researchers at the University of Rochester, Kansas University Medical Center, and as well as the Virginia Commonwealth University. Uh, we also received feedback from several researchers, organizations, and advocacy groups such as the FSHD Society and patients to get feedback about what types of questions we should be asking, other things that we should be thinking about. And then in addition to the survey, we also included the perceived stress scale. It's a previously developed survey um, done by a, a doctor in Carnegie Mellon and it's been verified multiple times in multiple studies over the years. And this is a great way to measure people's perceived stress during a stressful period, such as a pandemic. Um, so that way we can get some more quantifiable data to assess. And then um, we distributed the survey with the help of registries and advocacy groups, again, through the FSHD Society and others. Um, and we prim primarily focused on FSHD myotonic dystrophy, and limb girdle muscular dystrophy, as those are the most prevalent muscular dystrophies in adults. Um, of course, Duchenne muscular dystrophy is very common, but that's more um, common in children. And we excluded that just because it would require a whole different set of questions for the um, children and for their caregivers. And we distributed the survey in early May because we wanted to see how um, the pandemic early on and its associated policies such as social distancing were affecting people. And our goal was to examine the social and health impacts of the pandemic and social policies on people with muscular dystrophies to help guide their care. And that's really how the conversation started up was we have all these changes in everyone's care and we wanted to see how, what we could learn from the survey to better provide care. So a little bit more about the survey for those who did not see it or complete it. Um, we asked, of course, about demographics and disease history. So people self-reported what neuro, um, neuromuscular disease they had, and most did report that they've had genetic confirmation. And then we also asked about, of course, the COVID-19 medical history and how many people had actually um, been affected by COVID or people who they lived with, because we thought that that might obviously have an impact on their responses and how they've been impacted during this period. And we actually um, only had seven of our participants um, be affected with COVID-19, four with FSHD, and three with myotonic dystrophy. And, um, and then about five individuals reported having family members who were affected. So this was less than 1% of our entire population. So we weren't really able to um, provide a lot, get a lot of data that we could depend on to apply to the rest of the population. Um, so at least that was good news too, because it's always nice to hear that not many people were affected. But of course, if we were to repeat the survey, which has been brought up multiple times um, now, as we are farther along into the pandemic, we might obviously see those numbers be a little higher and maybe um, an impact on the questions, on the responses. And then of course we focused on the impact um, on exercise, pain, mental health, and medical care. And some of these were of course suggestions by patients and, and other providers. Um, and then we also wanted to get into um, telemedicine because this was a relatively new experience for a lot of providers and a lot of patients. Um, it had been done on a much smaller scale prior to the pandemic, but then once a lot of visits had been needed to be canceled due to the pandemic, um, it forced a lot of institutions to quickly implement telemedicine or virtual visits um, very fast. And so we wanted to see how patients um, were experiencing that. And then of course, as researchers, we wanted to see how research study participation was being affected by that, whether um, you know, they had study visits being canceled and, you know, and, and how, um, how their experience had been during, those, um, dur during the pan pandemic and being in a research study. Because um, as we all know, we're all trying to work towards a treatment and we didn't want that to slow down our goal towards getting a treatment. And you know, we wanted to make sure that we could if there's anything that we could glean from it to continue forward um, that, you know, that would be helpful to us. And then, as I said before, we, you know, included the perceived stress scale, um, which was a 10 question 
scale and um, assessing perceived stress during a specific period. So we specifically asked about the last several months um, when they were answered it in May. So we had participants from all across the world. So I highlighted all the different countries where we have participants, um, just to give you a nice visual. And we had over 1300 participants and primarily we had two thirds of them from the United States. That was about 860 participants. And then we had um, 132 from Europe, 165 from the UK, uh, about 20 from Australia, 30 from all of the Asian countries, and then 11 from South America. So I felt like we had a nice widespread um, representation. Um, I do want to note, sorry, I'll go back. Um, I do want to note that I, I will, I'll point out where we did just some analysis for the U.S. data only as we know that there are different uh, healthcare and different social policies implemented in different in the different countries. So some some of it was a little easier to focus on the U.S. data, and um, in, in in regards to the analysis. So um, I'll point out where we we only focused on the U.S. data. But as our participants were two thirds of them were from the U.S., we felt that this was um, that we found the numbers very similarly represented as um, to the rest of the participants in the study. So um, as far as what types of, types of um, muscular dystrophies they had, we found most of them had FSHD. So thank you to all of our FSHD participants um, for you know, um, responding the most. Um, 48 people in the study did not um, indicate a muscle disease, a particular muscle disease, or they just said other. Um, so we had a couple of those. And then as um, you'll also see the primary, um, primarily females completed the survey as well. And then the average age range was around 53 for participants. And that was similar to what we saw in FSHD with an age range of nine to 87. Um, as I said, we only included adults, but um, there was, a, we had caregivers also provide um, information. And so there was one, one person who was nine years old with limb girdle that responded to the survey. And then we wanted to ask a question about participants living alone versus with others, because we wanted to see if there were specific challenges um, in relation to those who lived alone, obviously, versus with others who could help them um, with, with different things during the pandemic. And we did find that most um, people lived with others um, and, and there was a very small percentage that actually lived alone amongst all of the muscular dystrophies. So we weren't able to um, make a whole lot of conclusions from that um, just because of the majority of patients who said that they lived with others. And then we also wanted to look at ambulatory or wheelchair use and see if um, ambulation um, also caused issues um, for people or um, or brought up some, some in, um, things for us to think about. And as you'll see again, um, primarily people did not use wheelchairs and we really did not find that it affected um, their stress levels or provided additional challenges. Oh, there it goes. Um, so then of course we asked about the challenges that they faced during the COVID-19 pandemic. And from this, you will see that the majority was obtaining treatment, that people had obviously many visits, um, appointments, and um, doctor's visits that were canceled or rescheduled. And then, um, of course, social distancing was another challenge, obtaining essentials, and, um, and then stress management. So we were glad that we um, included the perceived stress scale so that we could get more data on stress management. And then I want to point out too that this is just U.S. data as well, um, but it is um, comparable when you look at the rest of the participant data. And so then we always ask about other because everyone always comes up with um, questions that we did not think of or, or comes up with topics that we did not think of. So this is from all participants um, who responded to the other and the most common um, challenges they said in the other section was um, Exercise, of course, a lot of gyms closed down, depression and anxiety, boredom, performing house chores. So obviously 
um, some people probably had people helping them out, but due to social distancing, they probably um, you know, now had to look at doing that themselves. Homeschooling, which of course is now a challenge. So again, if we were to look at repeating the survey, we might get some more interesting data now that school has started up again. Uh, isolation, of course, due to the social distancing policies. Uh, no church, you know, not being able to attend church, and then working more hours. And then this is also U.S. data only, uh, but types of challenges due to social distancing. Uh, of course, the number one was feeling alone, or feeling isolated. And then um, performing daily tasks was also a challenge and receiving care. Um, and so that, that was where um, kind of expected responses. Um, and then as far as other challenges that, again, all participants um, put, pointed out as challenges due to social distancing were, again, exercise, attending appointments, work um, where people either had to stay home from work or were furloughed or lost their employment. Of course, childcare as daycares and schools closed down and then mental health, um, getting supplies. And then one interesting thing that several people actually listed was um, standing for long periods, like in line. So I guess waiting for to get into a store or waiting for people to sanitize the conveyor belt at the grocery store before they put them up. Um, so some people ex you know, have a lot of fatigue for standing for long periods. So they pointed that out as a challenge for them. And then of course, we wanted to know about the impact on their muscle disease. And um, so, so surprisingly, people, most people said that they did not experience any change in their muscle disease. Of course, we understand this is still kind of early on, a couple months into the pandemic. Um, so, and then, then the next most common response was that their muscle disease was slightly worse. And, um, and, and those who reported significant worsening of their condition um, also reported that they did not exercise and that, or they had reduced their exercise. And then they also reported worsening pain. So um, I'll get into that in a little bit, um, which is actually the next slide. Um, so um, a majority of patients um, did say that they experienced pain during the pandemic um, and then uh, we asked them to rate their pain prior to the pandemic and then their current pain levels. And as you'll see across the board, um, everyone said that they had increased pain um, during the pandemic. And then we wanted to look at exercise um, as a, this was a suggestion by providers and by patients as a topic that is important to people with muscular dystrophy. And as you'll see, most people reported that their exercise had decreased during the pandemic. Again, this is expected as gyms have closed and then exercise equipment has become um, less available um, as people are buying it up. Um, but then, uh, so, we, so we did find that exercise largely decreased and this makes sense as we talked about how pain has increased um, as there seems to be an association with that. And so the perceived stress scores, um, we broke this out by diagnosis, gender, age, and ambulatory status. Uh, the higher the, sco the score, the more stress. Uh, so zero to 13 is low stress. 14 to 26 is moderate stress, and anything greater than 26 is high or severe stress. And as you'll see, all of these scores fall in the moderate stress range. And um, you'll see um, that for diagnosis, um, FSHD actually reported slightly less stress, um, but still comparable to the other diseases. And then we found that females um, and um, people, primarily females under 30, experienced more stress or at least reported higher stress levels. And that's actually comparable with worldwide studies that have come out um, for the whole population um, that females under 30 um, were reporting these higher stress levels. And then ambulatory status, again, we kind of looked at to see if there was a difference and, um, and it and is pretty comparable like across the board, whether you know, no wheelchair use part-time or full-time. Although um, full-time wheelchair use still shows a slight um, lower stress level. Um, and um, so, so there's, there's different things that we can assume from that. Um, you know, I like to think too that people 
probably prior to the pandemic um, have already adapted to using the wheelchair and, and making accommodations so that when the pandemic hit, it wasn't much of a, a change for them because they had already had certain um, things in place to allow them to adapt. So then we wanted to know how um, people have been managing their stress and so that we could share that with others and, and hopefully that would help others who may be having difficulty managing their stress. Um, so the majority of the responses were sleep or rest uh, and then exercise was the next thing. And as obviously as the months have gotten a little bit warmer, people have been finding ways to get outside and do exercise that way. And then uh, meditation was also another common um, response. And then people also pointed out mental health services and journaling and then community outreach and support. And, you know, luckily for, um, since there's so many virtual ways to reach out to others, you know, the FSHD Society obviously has their Facebook page and their website and ways to connect people. Um, it helps provide people more support that way. So that's good that we can still do that during this period of, of social distancing. And then of course, we always ask about other ways people are managing their stress because again, they always come up with things that we don't think about. Um, and so the larger, and so this is our lovely word cloud and the larger the word, the more common that response was amongst participants. So we see family, friends, prayer, reading, talking. Um, if we actually, um, a lot of these are like a bunch of different hobbies. Um, so when I was going through the data, if I had just put everything under the category of hobbies, that would probably be a much larger word um, because definitely people have been finding ways to make themselves busy or get into something that is more enjoyable for themselves. Um, then that has seemed to help them manage their stress that way. And then we get into telemedicine. Again, the virtual visits that we wanted to examine to see how th those were going. Because again, this had to be implemented so quickly and we wanted to make sure that this transition was smooth and that patient's experience was positive. Um, and so we found um, like three quarters of them were satisfied with their telemedicine visits. So that was good. Um, but then of course, um, three quarters of them preferred in-person visits. And, and that makes sense too. I mean, there's a lot of pros and cons to both, but it's nice to know that telemedicine may be more of an option for people who, who, make, who, it's, who it's difficult to get to in-person appointments. Um, so it's nice that that might be something that can be continued after all of this. And then future participation in research. So again, we wanted to see um, if people, um, how their, how their uh, experience in research was going during this period and if it affected their likeliness to continue in research. And 10% of our participants were participating in research at the time. And about half of them reported that their research visits were affected by the pandemic, such as their visits were canceled or, um, or rescheduled. Um, I, I don't recall anyone saying that their study was canceled at all, like, or their study was um, discontinued. So that was good news, because as we know, we're all trying to work towards a treatment. And so luckily, most people said that, um, that either they would be, un, you know, that they're likelihood to participate in research is unchanged or definitely likely, and majority of them were definitely likely, so that was really nice to see that. Um, because as um, researchers, you know, we're striving to make sure that, you know, we value people who participate in, in research, we value their time, and especially now during the pandemic with everything changing and um, things are not as um, consistent as they used to be, or we have to do things a little differently than we used to. Uh, we definitely appreciate everyone's time and flexibility with that. And, um, and we try to make it as smooth as possible for everyone while still maintaining their safety, which is the number one priority. So in conclusion, um, we found that the pandemic had a modest impact on people with muscular dystrophy, including FSHD. As I showed, there was moderate stress levels reported, um, but the um, stress levels were similar to the general population, um, which is good. Um, and, you know, and, and this may be due to the fact that, you know, the muscular dystrophy population has already found ways to manage their stress um, with their daily challenges um, that they're experiencing before um, this whole period. 
And then as far as like some take home messages for everybody, uh, what were the most reported techniques for stress? As we talked about resting and sleeping, exercise and meditation. And then the most reported techniques for, um, for those who saw disease improvement, um, who actually did think that their disease improved over this period were exercise, um, stress management and pain improvement. Um, so that makes a lot of sense um, as well because other studies have actually shown an association between increased exercise and improved sense of health. So for providers, they can um, focus on issues of stress, pain, and exercise during this period to maybe provide more optimal care. So that is the end of my talk. I want to say um, thank you for listening. Um, I hope you found some of the information helpful. Um, definitely thank you to all the survey participants, all the research participants, because of course we can't do this without you. Um, and you are very much a part of the team. And of course, thank you again to the FSHD Society for hosting us, um, hosting this webinar and, and getting out this information for us. And then the URMC National Registry for Myotonic Dystrophy and FSHD, the Myotonic Dystrophy Foundation, Coalition to Cure Cal Pain, the Speak Foundation and Jane Foundation for all being involved in this process with giving us feedback and sending out our survey to all the participants so we can have um, good data to share with everyone. Great. Thank you so, so much for that, uh, Leanne. Um, uh, we, we're starting to get in some questions. If you have questions for Leanne or uh, Dr. Eichinger, Dr. Statland, please uh, feel free to start posting them in the Q&A section. And um, also, uh, I wanted to give um, Dr. Eichinger and Dr. Statland an opportunity to make additional comments or if you'd like. No, I mean, I think the, that, um, you know, this is, this is our first, first glimpse really on how people are doing, um, you know, during the pandemic with the different social policies going on. I mean, obviously, um, as the pandemic's evolving, I think one of the strengths of, of having a time point like this is it will give us a, a point to compare against. And so it will be important as we move forward to, you know, um, maybe ask people again and see, because I think as the pandemic wears on, there's sort of a different set of challenges that people may be experiencing. Yes, I'm glad you mentioned that because you, um, Leanne alluded to people asking if the survey will be run again at this time point, I guess you know, six months post uh, the initial shutdown. Um, what are the prospects for that? Um, well, I can, I can let, so, so Katie and Leanne are doing most of the work. Uh, so it's very easy for me to, to say that it's gonna happen. Um, but I think that, um, yeah, it's very easy. The system that we set up for this survey uh, is very easy for us to, to release it again. Um, I think it's really just wanting to hit the right time. I think we're, we're sort of coming up against some other uh, competing things that would be, um, probably we would wanna wait till after the election season, but at that point, it might be time to, to see how people are doing again. Oh, we'll be uh, keeping an eye out and of course we'll be delighted to help again in distributing that um, survey. So um, uh, I was, uh, okay, um, here's a question from Anne. Let's see, are there any um, studies with the general population that you can compare these results against? Yeah, uh, we, you know, we did look at a lot of different studies um, that were going on at the time. Uh, and, and as I said before, um, you know, the stress levels um, were compared um, or comparative in the general population to what we were seeing in the muscular dystrophy population. But um, she also, yeah, added that um, comparing the satisfaction with respect to virtual doctor's appointments with the satisfaction level um, of the general population. Um, so, I, I had I have not done um, a quick I haven't I haven't done um, updated research on how people are satisfied with their telemedicine visits right now and I think that would be important too as we probably have more data as more people have more experience with telemedicine visits. And is it true the te telemedicine 
visits, I think one thing that happened was the restrictions on giving telemedicine consults across state lines or something. There, there, were, li there were certain restrictions that were lifted at the beginning of the pandemic. Are those uh, expected to continue? And um, I, I think this is, this is if, if, you're, if you're listening yeah. and you've, you've uh, participated in telehealth and it's something you've enjoyed, um, this is a political question um, as well as a practical one. They are reevaluating um, the situation right now, and there's there's a discussion. You may read about it in your newspaper now that they're talking about rescinding the reimbursements uh, for the uh, de decreasing the reimbursements for the telehealth visits. This will make it more complicated to be offering them in the same way. So they're not necessarily going to continue that policy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um. We have a comment from Alan who says, on a personal level, I had to weigh the risks of COVID against the loss of muscle. I've opted to join a local gym that is taking exceptional cautions to members of the gym. I've been going to the gym for three weeks and it has helped my strength as well as my mental and emotional well-being. And um, I think- Yeah, I was, I was actually responding to him and then also I'll just say it out loud. Um, you know, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. It's always great to hear that you're seeing, you know, an improvement. Um, I think a lot of us are weighing benefits during risks during this time. And I think, you know, as more people are becoming more cautious and these outbreaks or spikes have been starting to become more controlled in a lot of different areas of the country, you know, I think people can start to feel a little safer to go out there and obviously the gyms have their requirements to um to keep you know infection um rates down there so you know obviously everyone has to do what's best for them i think uh, I, was... I would just just go add ahead. to that is that um i think it's also important to remember that exercise has lots of benefits it's not just the physical benefit but as you pointed out the emotional and mental health um, benefits of exercise are, are really important, um, in particular that when we're dealing with all the extra stress that we are right now. I noted that around 25% of the people who responded to the question about exercise said they were doing more. Um, and that was interesting. Uh, I'm sort of imagining that with the social distancing and shut down that people, some people have more time. They're not commuting. They're not you know, taking an hour more out of their day just to get back and forth to an office or something. So, um, and just for myself personally, I, I started um, doing uh, virtual sessions with a fitness trainer mm -hmm. and I love that. I do it like three times a week now, <laughs> whereas I wasn't really doing it before. So, so uh, I think remote, um, sessions with physical therapists and, and trainers is something that people should really, you know, look into. And, and what, what I wonder there is, you know, there obviously might be concerns if you have um, FSHD and just to make sure you're safe, that you're, if you're going to be doing it at home, that um, do you have any advice in the, there in terms of how to safely do an exercise regimen from home? Um, I think as, as people can try to adapt the things that they were doing in other environments um, to what they can do at home. Um, and, and some of that involves equipment and some of it's not. So um, if, you know, if walking is something that you can do safely, that's an easy way to get exercise in. Um, and, and I would also say physical therapists along with um, other healthcare providers are also providing telemedicine. So I think that um, if you're unsure of what you want to be able to do at home, um, connecting with a physical therapist remotely or virtually um, is also a possibility and they may be able to help you set up an individual exercise program that you can be doing in your home environment. Great. Thank you. I'll also put in a quick plug. We, we did create a uh, video series with Tina Duong from Stanford for short, you know, exercises you can do from home. Many of them while seated. So that might be a safer position to be doing, you know, especially upper body uh, work. So if you don't know about it, it's on our YouTube channel and I, I, I encourage you to check it out and, and watch those. Um, I was intrigued uh, that 
you said younger female um, individuals reported a higher level of stress. Um, and I, it sounded like that's across the general population too, not just in the neuromuscular population, but do you have any thoughts as to why that is? Yeah, well, some of our, our research about other studies going on with that as well, we're showing that women tend to take on more of the childcare responsibilities. So when both partners in the home are, are working, that the women tend to be the ones who change their work status um, to help take care of the kids. So when school shut down and daycare is closed, um, you know, when, when women tended to be the ones who were staying home and, and taking care of the kids. So um, that was one of the things that showed up in a lot of the studies. Um, and that makes sense why, you know, women who are under 30, <laughs> um, you know, or maybe experiencing more stress. So that was just one of the studies though. I'm sure there's a, a ton of other reasons that people can come up with um, who, who could say, you know, as to why um, that they're experiencing more stress. Um, I do want to point out too, that we did have more female participants for the study anyway. So um, when we adjusted for gender, um, we didn't see a huge difference in stress um, at that point. Um, but, um, you know, it's, it's, it was still comparable to what they were seeing in these um, other um, general population studies. Mm -hmm. I guess that's when we're, maybe the solution isn't so simple. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I noticed um, also, I mean, meditation was something a lot of people turned to. Did they, um, I don't know if per people provided details about how they accessed meditation. Did they just uh, already know how to do it or did they uh, use apps or do you, do you have? Yeah, we did not have additional questions on that. Um, but again, that's like something that we might consider going forward if we repeated the survey is to maybe adjust some of our questions and try to delve into some more of these themes that we were seeing now. Um, but yeah, no, they did not provide details, but because a majority of them did, I, I wouldn't assume they all already were meditating, but maybe they were, you know, um, but they obviously found different ways. I mean, luckily, you know, it's not 1918, it's, you know, 2020. So we have a lot of technology available to us. There's a lot of resources out there for people to learn how to do these different things. Um, so, um, so hopefully, you know, I'm, I'm assuming people were just very resourceful in finding out ways to do that and, and finding ways to help themselves manage their stress through meditation. Great. Yeah. Um, again, I encourage the audience, if you have additional questions, uh, please post them. Uh, there's a comment here from Anne that uh, she has participated in two telemedicine calls across the border between U.S. and Canada, and also four within Canada for her spouse. Um, so she's just supportive of the idea that tele telehealth has a place going forward. And we certainly hope so. We've been wanting that for, for many years for our communities. And so I hope that doesn't go away. I hope it becomes more available rather than less available over time. So. Yeah, I, def I definitely think as providers have really implemented that, they're also seeing the benefits to telemedicine visits. Uh, so I, I don't think that's, that's gonna go away, which is, which is good. Maybe Dr. Statlin, do you you've probably been involved in consults from many places during these past six months. What have you learned from that? And what, um, what kinds of things might you be doing to sort of make it more available or to, uh, or in the future? What do you? Um, for, you mean for telehealth? Um, yes. So I, you know, this telehealth is something I've been, uh, very interested in doing for a long time. You know, the the issues with it are unfortunately not what I want to do, but rather what institutions will allow us to do. The um, um, it has been a grand experience uh, experiment. So you know, when the pandemic started, um, my clinic flow went to over two thirds of the visits were telehealth. Uh, our our clinic numbers stayed the same, but we just shifted to the telehealth platform. And I think that. One of the things that was valuable about it is, you know, 
it was forcing us to start to reconsider how we think of our multidisciplinary model because one of the things about my clinic that I think is very important is it's not that you just see me, it's that we have physical therapists, occupational therapists, they're all really available there uh, for people. And so we were having to adapt, not just how are we going to get the physician on the line to talk to someone, but also how do we get these other professionals, you know, to join that conversation? How do we make sure there's crosstalk between the people so we're getting coherent care, care um, to individuals? And I think we've been making some progress towards that. I think uh, as, a, as medicine in general, this is one of the models that needs refinement and it's gonna need input from the people who are receiving it. So if you're having a telemedicine visit, I mean, think about how the flow was, you know, how did it work with you seeing other people or were you so only that you saw the doctor on the call? Um, because, you know, I, I do think it's, it's going to remain an important feature and hopefully we'll be able to continue to add it because there's certainly individuals that I've seen through telehealth who had trouble coming to clinic. And so to the ability to be able to offer it for them was really important, either physical barriers, distance barriers, or other reasons why coming to clinic was, was not really possible. Great, thank you. Um, so Aura Moltensky is asking if it's possible to see the challenges bar graph from your slide. Sure. So again, so if you, while you do that, she mm -hmm. also, comments that she discovered she can exercise standing on her balcony while holding onto the rail. <laughs> and it was not something she had done before the pandemic, so. I, I hope she means on the solid part of the balcony, not hanging from the rail. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll, I can go ahead and share my screen then for that and show that, that slide again. It always takes a nice second to adjust, there it goes. So, there we go. Great, thank you for that. Um, I'm really glad to see that People didn't think the care giving or care receiving were that impacted. A few people did, but I was very concerned about people not being able, not being able to have their care <laughs> providers come and see them and so on. So. Right. So, or I don't know. Oh, okay, maybe there's a question. <laughs> oh, she wants to know: Can you say more on how telemedicine visits are? are uh, becoming, I guess, a, an issue that involves politics. I guess, um, what can people, what can patients do to advocate for it? I'll let Dr. Statlin handle this one. <laughs> um, well, I mean, I think you just, you need, to, you need to make it clear that this is something that you want. I mean, these decisions are, are made, um, you know, by, and it's a combination of factors, the insurance providers, Health and Human Services, um, you know, uh, Medicare guidance. And so, you know, many of these decisions are made by, um, you know, our political leaders. If, if, you know, you can actually, you know, reach out to the FSHD Society who can, you know, serve as an advocate to, to let your voice be heard um, politically. But, you know, I think it's, it's a combination of the physician saying that we think they sh that this is needed and the people who are receiving the care to, you know, make, make our people who run, you know, run our government understand that this would be an important service to offer. Um, and it intersects, of course, with kind of economics and insurance reimbursements, right? Whether they, whether yeah. they will be willing the, to the reimburse. Are, are complicated. That's right. It, it has to do with the insurance uh, reimbursements and the cost of care. Mm -hmm. um, you know, typically the, um, the time was not reimbur reimbursed at a level for telehealth that would make it um, feasible for many of the, the health centers to, you know, to allow it. We're required to um, you know, see a certain number of people um, for the clinic. The 
um, that was the big change that occurred. They took that restriction off and they allowed reimbursement to match an in-person visit. Um, and that's what's being revisited right now. And of course, the medical um, provider institutions are under added financial stress these days, partly on the one hand, the high cost of care for COVID patients, and on the other hand, the loss of revenue from postponed medical procedures and visits and so on. So it's really, it's kind of a perfect storm, of, <laughs> unfortunately, but um, I think it'd be important to be able to show that, um, that telemedicine, you know, telehealth visits have benefits and can, you know, improve outcomes over time for patients who might otherwise not have access to you know, any care or adequate care. So um, that's something we'd certainly be interested in looking at and working together on. Right. Yeah. And I've had a lot of patients too say that it's been great for them to access specialists, you know, across the country. You know, you hear about these big names and, and these experts in these fields, but people don't necessarily have the means um, to, to get to them physically, um, but if they can have a telemedicine consult or visit with them, you know, that, that allows them greater access to, you know, to better care too. Great, thank you. Uh, Leanne, I think we can stop sharing that screen and I think we're, um, I don't see other questions at the moment, so maybe this is a good time to um, conclude and I'd like to bring Beth Johnston back on to make some closing announcements. Certainly. Wow. That was awesome, guys. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you everyone for attending our FSHD University webinar today. A very special thank you, obviously, to Ms. Leanne Lewis, Drs. Eichinger and Statlin for taking the time um, to be with us today and for all this really awesome information. Thank you guys very much. Um, our next FSHDU webinar is in two weeks on Thursday, October the 15th. It's at the same time. And our guest speaker is actually going to be um, Molly White from Dine Therapeutics. She's going to discuss with us the patient community's critical role in accelerating therapy development. So that's going to be a great webinar two weeks from today on October the 15th. Um, also, be sure to tune in to the FSHD Society radio show next Wednesday evening. It's on Facebook Live with our awesome host, Tim Hollenbach. Um, Tim's guest this time is going to be singer, songwriter, and fellow FSHD patient, Josh Bergman. He's, he's great if you've heard him. He's got a little banjo and he just, he's amazing. He plays a lot on YouTube, he plays a lot on, on Facebook, and he honors um, the FSH community um, while doing it. So he's, he's a great guy. Um, check out our website for other upcoming FSHD University events. Molecular and clinical assessment. And watch your email as well. I'm going to put the, um, the web link in uh, the chat there so you've got it. Um, let me just do that. Panelists and attendees. There we go. It's in the chat. And then obviously the, our website's really a gateway to a whole library of educational material and, and event information. June um, also alluded to the fact that we've got amazing playlists on YouTube with um, you know, all sorts of things that we've, we've discussed, one being physical therapy at home. So be sure to visit both our website and um, the YouTube channel. So that's it. Again, thank you very much for joining us today and we will see you next time in a couple of weeks. Take care everybody and stay thank healthy. You. Bye, thank you. Bye, thank Bye. you.